finding stuff out that you want to know. Just ask me a question that I don't know. That's why finding stuff out is the name of the show. So just give me a shout and we'll figure it out with the help of some friends and the fun never ends on. Finding stuff out, finding stuff out, finding stuff out. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Hi, and welcome to Finding Stuff Out. I've been thinking about this globe lately because of a question from Kobe. Why is the world so important? Yeah, why is the world so important? Couldn't we and all the other creatures on Earth just get in a spaceship and go to another planet? Or a space station or something? I don't know if the Earth is really important, but by the end of the episode, I'll find out. Here's a question from Marion. Why do polar bears don't live here? Before I answer your question, Marion, I did some research, and here's a song that kind of sums it all up. Habitat, habitat, that's where a creature's living at. Some in the water, some in the trees, some in the desert, some in your trees. Food and water, shelter, space, that's what you need to live in a place. Yeah, food and water, shelter, space, that's what you need to live in a place. A creature's living at a habitat. A creature's living at a habitat. And many other things, a habitat. Well, Marion, I guess you don't live in northern Ontario, or other northern parts of Canada, or Russia, or Norway, or Alaska, or Greenland, because polar bears definitely live there. But I checked, and if brown bears live near you, then you could say the polar bear's cousins live near you. That's because polar bears and brown bears share a common ancestor. Just like if you have a cousin, you and your cousins have the same grandparents. A really long time ago, polar bears' ancestors left the south, like where you live, Marion. Then, as they moved to the north, they adapted to the Arctic habitat. The Arctic is very cold and has a lot of ice and water. So polar bears have a lot of body fat and heavy fur coats to keep them warm. They also have big feet, like paddles, to help them get around in the water and on the ice. Their fur is transparent. That means it's clear, so that they can blend in with the snow and ice and sneak up on their favorite food, seals. In the cities and towns where most of us live, our habitat, polar bears wouldn't be able to find the things they need to live. Please, anyone, where's a good seal restaurant? Plus, it's too warm. Ooh, lucky me! Why can't penguins fly? Well, Serena, for starters, a polar bear lives up here in the northern hemisphere. So if a penguin lived up here, he would have to learn to fly, or he'd be eaten by the polar bears. Mm, you look really tasty there, Mr. Penguin. But luckily for Mr. Penguin, he lives down here in the southern hemisphere. Ha <laughs> ha, you can't get me now! Oh! Penguins can't fly because they're too heavy. But in their habitat, that's actually an advantage. Their body fat protects them from the cold, and their bones are solid instead of hollow, which helps them stay underwater. Their wings act like giant flippers to help them swim fast so they can sneak up on their favorite food, fish. Now here's a question from Aiden. How many habitats are in the world? How many habitats are in the world? Let's see, there's mountains, marshes, tidal pools, deserts, prairies, rainforests, and that's just some of them. There's even this grilled cheese sandwich which I found in my drawer, and there's definitely something living on that. Hundreds of thousands of plants, eight million species of animals, seven continents, thousands of islands, air, water, land, head getting warm, brain overloading! You're gonna make my head explode. To answer your question, Aiden, I've come to this special place by the ocean, full of amazing creatures. And to help show me around is my special guest, Allison Roberts, who's a biologist and naturalist. So, Allie, today I'm trying to find the answer to the mind-boggling question, how many habitats are there? But first, what is a habitat? Well, the ha a habitat is basically anything a creature needs to survive. So it's at the shelter, the space, the water. It can be tiny, like you'd need a microscope to see it. Or it can be gigantic, like the, the whole entire planet could be one habitat. Whoa. 
But you know what, today let's talk about kind of in between. Okay. Let's talk about the intertidal zone. Intertidal zone, what's that? Well, we're standing right in the middle of it. Whoa. Inter means between and tidal, yeah. between the tides. Right. So you need a place that's between the high tide, which would be way up there, and the lowest tide, way down there. How many creatures are living here? Well, there's tons of creatures living here, but they have to be pretty special creatures to survive. A sand dollar. Too bad I can't spend it. Mmm, seaweed. People eat this stuff all the time. Mm. Check out all these hermit crabs. Whoa, there's tons. Oh, and look at the little small one. Hermit crabs are pretty weird because they have a really soft shell, and so they have to find another shell to give them a home. Like, this is a snail, yeah. but when that snail dies and yeah. the shell is left on the beach, right. another animal, the hermit, the crab, hermit crab, will move in. In the tide pool, even fish can survive. Oh, weird. But check out what this fish hides in. Whoa, it's the same color as the seaweed. Yeah, look at how many creatures there are in this tiny little space. Yeah. Millions of creatures in the intertidal zone. Allison brought me to a habitat right next to the intertidal zone, the forest. So this habitat has everything that other animals need to survive, right? Again, the forest is filled with millions of creatures that this is perfect habitat for. So like these leaves or the twigs or the dirt or the trees or anything in this forest could be a habitat for a creature or an animal, right? Yeah, everything's a habitat, but then all combined, it's also one habitat. So it's like a habitat inside of a habitat, inside of a bigger habitat, inside of a bigger habitat, inside of a bigger habitat. Okay, I'm gonna stop before my head explodes here. Look at the shell. I should take it home. Oh, but you have to remember, that shell is somebody's habitat. Right, so I should leave it here. Yeah, pretty much everywhere we go, some creatures, that's their habitat. So we have to respect each other's habitat. And treat it like it's our own. Exactly. Would you want somebody to pick up your house and walk away with it? No. Well, thanks for helping me find stuff out and for showing me all these cool habitats. No problem. Thanks for coming out and hanging out in my office. <laughs> Now I'm here with these guys to ask them if they could be any animal in any habitat, what would it be? Fish in the ocean. Cat in the volcano. A shark in the ocean. Lice in somebody's hair. <laughs> <laughs> a rabbit in the forest. A snake on a beehive. A pterodactyl living in a tree. Whoa! What does it look like? <laughs> And I personally would be a copycat living in a photocopier because then I can photocopy everybody's photocopies. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> some habitats can be very challenging. So today I'm making some challenging environments in My Great Challenge. Welcome to My Great Challenge. Today my great challengers are Kaylee, Nico, Jeremy, and Alana. So you two will be Team Polar Bear and you two will be Team Zebra. Have you ever gone to the Arctic? No. no. Well today, you're going on a trip there as well as to African savanna and an ocean tide pool. There are five spots for each habitat. You have to put a different animal on each spot in the habitat you think it belongs in. So you guys will have two minutes to complete this challenge. Team Zebra, you'll be first. Team Polar Bear, you guys can go downstairs and have some broccoli with my mom. Here are the animals that you can use. You have two minutes starting now. Go! I think this goes here. Mm -mm, like I, I think this goes here. Tiger fell. like a polar bear. Does the rabbit go anywhere? The rabbit's cute. Why is there dinosaurs here? <laughs> this goes in the African jungle. Kangaroo. Who's there too? Ew, it's sticky. Is this an yes. otter? Otter. Is this a wiener dog? Yeah. I like a wiener dog. Hey, this goes over there, I think. Yeah. I'm not sure about this red it's fox dead. if it goes in the Arctic. Uh, I don't know, maybe. Sea monster. 
Did the bees go anywhere? They're gonna sting you. I don't know, but I'll I just put this bunny here. Okay, time's up. <laughs> <laughs> so here are your results. In the Arctic, you put two seals, but I asked for a different animal for each habitat. You could have put the other seal in the tide pool. They can live in both habitats. So that's one point gone. So you have four there. African savanna, there's no kangaroos there. Silly they live in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> in the ocean tide pool, there are no whales in the ocean tide pool. And also, there are three bees here because each bee can live in all these mm. habitats. I didn't want to put a bee, I don't like bees. <laughs> okay, well now it's Team Polar Bear's turn. <laughs> so you have two minutes, starting now. No, wait, 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 wait. The starfish, there. Yeah, that's kind of obvious. <sighs> put that there. This probably goes in the savanne. Yep, go. What about this? That. It probably goes No, I think. Here. Well, yeah, probably. Savannah? Yes, yeah, Savannah. Mm. This might go in the Savannah. No. We have some disagreement here on one of the animals. Savannah? Yes. Polar bear in the Arctic. Oh yeah, I guess I can put that. Yeah. What about <laughs> the otter? That goes here. Okay, whatever. Otter with a fish in his hand. Using some logic. <laughs> I think this goes in the savanne, because when I did uh, my presentation, okay, he said this goes in the savanne. Uh, okay. Last few seconds. Savannah. I think this might go in the Arctic, because it's white. Five seconds. Put this there. Put ah. this there. Three, two, and time's up. <laughs> so you guys had three wrong. Let's see how Team Polar Bear did. We have two right in the Arctic, but they didn't fill the other three. The kangaroo in the savanna. <laughs> Same thing as a uh, team zebra. It's not right. And the whale in the tide pool. That's also wrong. It's too big to live in the tide pool. They also got that one wrong. So you guys have three, four, five wrong. So team zebra is our winner. Yeah! Well, thanks for playing my great challenge. You're welcome. Why don't dolphins live on land? I checked, and what I found out is pretty amazing. At one time, dolphins, or at least their ancestors, did live on land. Some scientists think that certain fish got very ambitious and learned to adapt to a habitat that included land. They evolved legs and lungs so that they could live on land as easily as in the water. Scientists think that those creatures evolved into other creatures that like to eat meat. It made an interesting adaptation to its habitat. It discovered that hiding under the water where other animals came to drink was a good way to get a meal. While they were down there waiting, the creatures discovered something else tasty to eat there. Fish! Yum, yum. Over thousands and thousands of years, the creatures evolved to be even faster in the water, and eventually their feet turned into flippers, and some scientists think they evolved into the dolphins we know and love today. With their flippers, dolphins can't walk on land like their ancestors could, even though they still need to breathe air like we do. <sighs> Excuse me, see you at the beach. <laughs> Here's a question from Patrick. Who killed the dinosaurs? A meteorite or a volcano? <laughs> Very interesting question. One day, while they were out for a walk, oh, this habitat is great. There's lots of room and, and shelter. Have you tried the vegetation? Mm, I have, it's very delicious, and the water is good too. <coughs> Harold, is that your stomach rumbling? You really shouldn't eat so fast. No, it was not me. Then what is that low rumbling sound? <coughs> Oh, it's a volcano! Run! Run for it! Was it a volcano? Or was it a meteorite? <laughs> to find out the answer, I've invited a special guest. He knows about extinction events and even where the dinosaurs went. Please welcome Dr. Hans Larsen. <laughs> Dr. Larson, whoa, ferns, 
Patrick was wondering if volcanoes or meteorites killed the dinosaurs, and you brought ferns. This is getting pretty weird. A little like you. So, Dr. Larson, you're not saying that the plants killed the dinosaurs, are you? Well, the plants didn't kill the dinosaurs directly, but something killed the plants. For some hundred thousands of years before the dinosaurs went extinct, right. there was a super volcano erupting in India. Like ginormous in size, lots and lots of eruptions going on. So I guess the volcano spewed out a ton of ash and that covered the sky, right? Well, and this was a super volcano, like probably covering the sky for the whole planet. Wow. And that may have kind of primed or got things ready for an extinction by sort of cooling down the planet, making it a little bit dimmer. But then exactly 65 and a half million years ago, a meteor the size of a large city crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula uh, just off the shore of Mexico, made a crater 180 kilometers wide and about 80 kilometers deep. So there's probably like smoke everywhere and everything? Yeah, smoke, heat, earthquakes, uh, shock waves all across the planet. And then it also lifted up everything into the sky. And oh. so blocking out the light. So there's and no sun? No sun. But can't they just eat in the dark? Because the power went out at my house once and we still did that. Yeah, but how many days? Uh, just for one. Right, and so with this kind of stuff going on six to five and a half million years ago, it probably lasted for many years, maybe 10,000 years of very little sunlight. So all the plants were decaying and molding and rotting. So these guys, you no can throw them away. plants, yeah, get rid of all the plants. So after a few years of that, maybe even just a few weeks, all these guys, all the herbivores died, finished. They're done. Out. And what about the carnivores? They could just eat each other, right? Well, they could eat these guys too. They probably true. ate them for a little bit. Right. And after some months or maybe a couple of years of, of eating the carcasses, bloating, yeah. rotting carcasses of other dinosaurs, yeah. they probably fed on themselves too. Right. And then they went. So eventually we can put them all in the garbage. So that's how the dinosaurs went then. Probably. I hope a meteor isn't coming for us. <laughs> well, the next one's scheduled to be here in 14 million years. 14 million years, so I think we're safe. <laughs> for now. Okay, thanks for being on my show. My pleasure. Thinking about dinosaur habitats gives me an idea for... Uh-oh, dude, try this at home. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Not too hot, not too cold? Enough food, shelter, water, space? Cause it's time to play How's Your Habitat? <laughs> Today, your challenge is to figure out what we humans need in our habitat to survive. So let's get right to it. Here's your first clue. If you said water, you're right. And you can reward yourself with a nice cold glass of drinking water. But don't, because if you do, you'll miss my next question. It's got you surrounded, but you can walk right through it. What is it? Are you ready? Because if you guessed air, you're right. We breathe oxygen, and unlike most fish, we get ours from the air. Okay, next question. You can't choose not to have this one in your habitat if you want to survive for long. I'd give you a bigger clue, but it's not polite to talk with your mouth full. Get it? The answer is food! Mmm, this one's got my name written all over it. Next question. It's something that lets you do this. If you guessed having itchy powder in your pants, you're wrong. Although, itchy powder would make you flap around like that. But nobody needs itchy powder in their habitat. If you can do what I just did without bashing into anyone, you've got space! Okay, last question. Even if you're living under a rock, you have this. And no, I don't mean six legs. Unless you're a beetle, then you do need them. I'm talking about shelter! Yeah! That's a roof over your head. A place that keeps the wind, rain, and snow off of you and keeps you from getting too hot or too cold. And now, here's a question from Rivian. Why do people pollute the earth when it isn't good for the earth? Well, Rivian, your question takes me to... The Flat Earth Corner! Step right up, folks. Take everything you need. Why this world is so big, we can't possibly use everything up. 
And don't worry about the forest. There's so much land out there, the animals can find someplace else to live. Mmm, chocolate. Bye, bye, bye. Bye, bye. For most of the time people have been on Earth, we thought there were no limits. We thought we could take as much as we wanted from the Earth and just throw things away. In the past, there weren't nearly as many people as there are now, so we could get away with it. We kind of polluted the Earth because it was easier than not polluting it. Sort of like the way it's easier to not clean your bedroom until you can't find anything you're looking for. Before, we didn't know any better, but now we realize that we can't keep doing that. Which leads me back to the question that began this trip. Why is the world so important? The Earth has the habitats that provide all the different basic needs of people, plants, and animals. Water, sunlight, food, space, and shelter. We don't know one other place in the universe that does that. Plus, we're already here. How lucky is that? Wow, Earth, now I know why you're so important to us. Thanks for watching Finding Stuff Out. See you next time. I'm gonna take good care of you. Ooh, that was a close one. Where creatures living at some in the water, some in the trees, some in the desert, some in your cheese. Food and water, shelter, space, that's what you need to live in a place. Yeah, food and water, shelter, space, that's what you need to live in a place. Yeah.